السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بارك الله فيكم. Welcome all the students of this series on the 99 names of Allah. This being session or class number 21. I'd like to welcome first and foremost Sister Rashida Abdul Rashid. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. From Virginia. Barakallah fikum. May Allah reward us all in our efforts to convey his religion. Uh, Sister Rashida was asking whether there was any chance to have a test after every 33 names. Um, uh, inshallah, I don't know, we can try to look into it. If you can help prepare the test, uh, we'd be very happy to offer it. We'll have to figure out what platform and etc how to do it, but I'm sure it could be done. Naziruddin, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, from Melbourne, Australia. May Allah protect our brethren in Palestine. Amin. I agree. Inshallah, we should all make dua these final nights of Ramadan for them. They're at the front lines of trying to keep the sha'air or the symbols of Allah, of Islam, alive. Zingai and from Cape Town, South Africa. Wa alaikum salam. Zabiba Hartman from Reutin, Germany. Wa alaikum salam. Zahida Shah. Wa alaikum salam to you and your family there in Indian occupied Kashmir. May Allah grant you also a long life and good health. Tonight is the night of the 27th of Ramadan there in Kashmir. May Allah accept it. So, as I mentioned before, the way to ensure that you catch it is to do the best that you can in terms of the Hajjud from day one of Ramadan to the end and especially in the last 10. And Nadira Tajuddin, reading us from Australia. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And she mentions, uh, these are comments now, really questions, I guess, so we can mention it. Uh, in Australia, Islamic schools are expensive. Some families in my community can't afford to send the kids. I've started teaching. Uh, bless you, your efforts. Inshallah, we're working to try to establish an online Islamic school from kindergarten to grade 12. Of course, we're starting off with the upper grades, nine to 12 first, and we're collaborating with a school in the US, um, inshallah, we hope to get that off the ground by September, Allah willing. We're working hard on it. Please everybody get pray for us. Uh, this would be an IOU sponsored uh, school, uh, which already exists. We're not creating one, but we are uh, collaborating with one, 
making it online. It's existent on the ground. It's been running for a number of years. The full Islamic staff, and, mashallah, a lot of committed Muslims to this project. Uh, inshallah, we'll pass out uh, more information as progress takes place. Suleiman in Goa, uh, wa alaikum salam uh, to you from Mombasa County in Kenya. I always wanted to visit Mombasa, but each time I went to Kenya, I was caught up in so many uh, activities in Nairobi that I didn't really get too much further out of uh, Kenya with that. But we would like to start uh, one of our, our learning centers in the um, Kabira uh, slum, one of the biggest slums in the world there in Kabira. I visited the masjid in Kabira. And mashallah, you know, the efforts are being made there. We need to bring in education. The madrasa is there, but we need to bring in you know, uh, tertiary education, make it available to our brothers and sisters who are there in Kabira uh, to help uplift them and get them out of this massive shanty down slum which uh, is just incredible. But, mashallah, people are surviving and Islam is alive. So, um, if uh, Suleiman, if you want to help us work on this project, then please contact me and let us uh, try to get some centers established there. Abu Bakr, Abdullah, wa alaikum salam. Halima B, wa alaikum salam from Phoenix, Arizona. Faisal Ali, wa alaikum salam. He's eagerly waiting for the books on the names of Allah, inshallah. As I said, there's already one out there by Dr. Omar al Ashkar, but uh, it, it's not as comprehensive as what we are <clears throat> what we are doing. This is what we're doing is more akin to what's available in Arabic. There's many available in Arabic, but in English, very few that are on the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, Amina B gives. Salams, wa alaikum salam to you. And uh, may Allah accept your dua for the success of this beautiful series. Uh, Juan Siegfried from the Philippines, good to see you back again. Wa alaikum salam. Ahnaf, Shan, Rayan, Arik, what a name. Wa alaikum salam to you. Yahuza, Haruna, wa alaikum salam. Ahmed Ali, DAIS student from Lahore, Pakistan. Barakallah fikum, DAIS being Bachelor of Arts in Islamic Studies at the International Open University, also known as the Islamic Online University. And may Allah give you a good health and a long life also. I mean, uh, Omar Ali from Kashmir, wa alaikum salam, Zaid, MashaAllah, Qasim Ali from Pakistan, asking how am I, inshallah, 
I hope I'm fine. Sometimes we, I think we're fine. And, you know, we can be not fine. So we pray that I am in fact fine, inshallah. Neef Davidson uh, from Ohio, USA. Wa alaikum salam. Um Asma. Asma. Jazana Wayakum. For the series. Finding it very beneficial, mashallah. It's great. Fahad Naji greeting us. Salam alaikum. Super Pax gave salams also. And um, <clears throat> Fahad is making dua for me and for IOU. May Allah accept them, inshallah, make these efforts beneficial to the Ummah and pleasing to him. And finally, Muna from Bangladesh gives her salams. So we will now progress to <clears throat> the next phase of our program in which we'll be starting with the new session. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al all praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. This is session 21 in which we will be looking at three names of Allah numbers 28, 29 and 30. Al-Alim, Al-Alim, and Al-Alam, the Omniscient, the All-Knowing. In terms of Quranic location for these three names, the divine name Al-Alim is mentioned 157 times in the Quran. Among them, Qalu Subhanak. La ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. He, Allah said, oh sorry, the angels said, uh, glorified, glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us indeed. You all are the all-knowing, wise. In terms of the name Al-Alim, it is mentioned 13 times in the Quran. Among them, Hu Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu alimu al-ghaybi wa shahada he is Allah besides whom there is no God, nor of the unseen. And in terms of Al-Alam, this is mentioned four times in the Quran. Among them, Qalu la ilma lana illa innaka anta al-alamul ghuyub. The angel said, we have no knowledge indeed, only you are the knower of the unseen. In terms of the meaning, linguistically, all three of these divine names, Al-Alim, 
Al-Alim and Al-Allam are built on the triliteral root Ain, Lam, Mim and are derived from the verbal noun, the master, Ilm, Ilmun, which means knowledge. These divine names have four main meanings. The first meaning is to have knowledge, to be aware and certain. The second meaning is to gather information. The third meaning is to have deep knowledge of minute details. And the fourth main meaning is to act according to knowledge. Now this root appears 854 times in the Quran in 14 de derived forms. For example, Elm, knowledge. Alima, to know. Allama, to teach. And A'lamu, to be more knowledgeable. Linguistically, Alim is the intensive form of the present participle, Alim, a knower, a person with knowledge. On the pattern of Fa'il, like Rahim, in relationship to Rahim. Al Alim is the all and ever knowing. The divine name Al Alam, on the other hand, is the most intensive form of the word Alim on the pattern Fa'al. It expresses the perfection and totality of Allah's knowledge. Al Alim comprehends everything with certainty. No knowledge is concealed from him, and he is intuitively aware of all things, even before they take place. Relative to Allah, these divine names, Al Alim, Al Alim, and Al Lam, Al Alam, according to the 10th century. Persian scholar Ibn Jarir at Tabari meant that he who knows without being taught by these names fundamentally meant he who knows without being taught everything that was and is, who alone knows the unseen, which is completely hidden from his creation. Ibn al-Qayyim, in his poem called the Nuniya, who is a 13th, 14th century scholar, described Allah's knowledge of the unseen saying, likewise, he knows what will happen tomorrow, what was and what now exists. Likewise, he, kn he knows if the non-existent did exist, how it possibly would be. Moving on to the application, Ibn Battal's methodology, his four principles, the first of which is to adopt where applicable. And these divine names, these three divine names, Al-Alim, Al-Alim, and Al-Alam, are grounded in the divine concept of omniscience, complete and comprehensive knowledge on an infinite plane, which human knowledge cannot begin to fathom, much less imitate. Therefore, human beings cannot think to imitate or adopt it. However, Allah's act of teaching Adam the names of everything, which subsequently elevated humankind above the levels of the angels and the jinn can be imitated by human beings on our level by learning and teaching each other. The divinely distinguishing primordial act elevated the status of the student and teacher to a lofty position, which should be adopted by protecting and promoting it in all ways possible. 
the teacher model of the Prophet وسلم, is a standard which Muslims have lost. And this model is particularly re relevant to Muslims of the developing world today, where the teaching profession is looked down upon as it is the lowest paid profession. The consequence of this negative view is that there is a shortage of Muslim teachers for modern secular subjects in Muslim schools all over the Muslim world. So non-Muslim teachers are hired in droves. I just recently returned from Addis Ababa, or Addis Ababa, which is how they pronounce it, Ethiopia, home to over 50 million Muslims, and visited the best Islamic schools, where in virtually all of them, non-Muslim teachers outnumbered Muslims. I mean, some places it was like 80%, almost 90%. Likewise, when I was in, uh, when I was in um, <clears throat> Chennai, setting up an Islamic school, set up there called uh, Fajr International School, it's still functioning. This is in Tamil Nadu, the southern part of India, home to over 200 million Muslims. We couldn't find Muslim teachers to cover the so-called secular subjects. I mean, I experienced this firsthand. However, the Islamic reality is that Allah described Prophet Muhammad وسلم, primarily as an educator. It is he who sent from among the illiterate a messenger reciting his verses to them, purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom. And the Prophet Muhammad himself had reiterated this fact in a well-known hadith narrated by Jabir, in which he said, In Allah lam yaba'athni mu'annitan. Mu Allah did not send me as an inflexible troublemaker, but rather he sent me as a teacher and a facilitator. The Prophet Muhammad elevated the role of the teacher to one which every Muslim should strive for. In a well-known hadith narrated by Abu Huraira, in which he said, Ad-dunya mal'una, mal'unun ma fiha, illa dhikrullah, wa ma wala, wa aliman, wa muta'al, aw muta'alima. The world and its contents are cursed, except for the remembrance of Allah, and what helps us to do so. The scholar, teacher, and or the student. Furthermore, the Prophet Muhammad praised those who learn and taught the Quran as being the best amongst Muslims, saying, Khairukum man ta'allam al Qur'ana wa allama. The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. We've all heard this hadith many, many times. Learning and teaching. In the West, Teachers are highly valued and highly paid. Primary and secondary inst uh, educational institutions understand full well that the higher the quality of teachers, the better the standard of graduates. According to the IT principle, garbage in, garbage out. Consequently, we need to encourage our intelligent and motivated youth, beginning with our own children, to study education as their first choice and not 
as their last choice if they can't get into medicine, law, and engineering. Furthermore, we need to revise our teaching methodology from rote learning to understanding, from teacher-centered to student-centered, as the West has done since the 60s. They discovered the inquiry method of teaching and revamped their educational institutions, while the Muslim world and the developing world in general remained stuck in the rote method of learning, which they inherited from the schools of their colonial masters. The rote learning method has its origins in the Catholic catechisms, where faith was taught in a question and answer format. What is this? It is that. What is this? It is that. And this was developed from the late Middle Ages, We're talking about the 15th century in Europe, spread all over Europe. This was the method. Muslims didn't apply this method. Later on, actually, after the colonial era, etc., or during it, many did adopt this method as they ad adopted basically the whole method of education as they say, hook, line, and sinker from the uh, colonial masters. So sadly, Muslims have forgotten the prophetic method of teaching. His most popular method was the inquiry method, which the West has discovered recently, where we teach using questions provoking the students to think rather than just pouring on them knowledge uh, on a spoon or throwing a bucket of water at them and whoever gets wet got wet. For example, on the 10th of the Hijjah, the Prophet ﷺ asked, all who were present. Do you know what day this is? They replied, Allah and his messenger knows best. The Prophet Sallallahu remained silent until the companions thought he was going to call it by another name. Then he said, isn't this the day of sacrifice? And the crowd answered, yes, indeed. And then he went on to explain, give them a full lecture. But it started off with, do you know what day this is? As if they didn't know. No, they knew. But it was to put them in a frame of mind, you know, an inquiring frame of mind in order to grasp everything that he was about to give them. On another occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu was reported by Abu Huraira to have asked them, do you know who is bankrupt? Actually, I think we all have heard this many times. And of course, they replied, this is different. They didn't say, we don't know. Many times they would say, Allah and his messenger knows best, or they just remained completely silent. Sometimes they did respond. Like when he asked about who is bankrupt, do you know who he is? Who is the bankrupt person? They replied, the bankrupt among us is one without money or goods. They said, among us. You, know, you may have something else to say, but among us, it's one without money or goods. The Prophet ﷺ went on to tell them who the truly bankrupt were among us. He said, indeed, the bankrupt of my nation are those who come before Allah on the day of resurrection with prayers, fasting and charity, all these good deeds. But they also brought along with them insults, slander, consuming the wealth of others, shedding the blood of others, harming others with their hands in so many different ways. The oppressed will be given from their good deeds until the good deeds run out before full justice has been fulfilled. Then the sins of the oppressed people who are coming 
to get their hak, get their right. The sin, their sins will be cast onto our evil scale of evil deeds. And we will be thrown into the hellfire. Even though we came with all fasting and prayers and charity in the very beginning. That is the truly bankrupt. So, of course, the Prophet ﷺ could have just said to them, the lesson today is about the truly bankrupt. And who are they? They are these who do this, that, and the other. But he chose to ask them a question. Do you know who is truly bankrupt? This would cause whatever he had to say to be imprinted in their brains. They would never forget it. Ibn Mas'ud, he reported that on one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ asked, who among you considers the wealth of his heirs dearer to him than his own wealth? This question. They, this is obvious. He said, every one of us loves his own wealth more. He's bringing a point across to them. So the Prophet ﷺ then went on to say, his wealth is whatever he spends during his life. The wealth of his heirs is whatever he leaves behind after his death. This is a big point to think about. This is how the Prophet brought it home. Because what you're saying, you, of course, your own wealth is dearer to you than the, than the wealth of your heirs. But in practice, we don't live that way. If it's dearer to us, it's only going to benefit us if we use it. Use it for what is beneficial. So the Prophet is encouraging us to do that rather than just hoard, gather, collect, consume only for ourselves. So there are many other narrations which confirm that the most popular teaching method used by the Prophet was the inquiry method. I'm sure you all heard the hadith about backbiting. Where he asked, do you know what backbiting is? And then he went on to elaborate. And he said, then, do you know the rights of the neighbor? Do you know who is stingy? So many narrations of that nature. In fact, Hadith Jibril, or the Hadith of Angel Gabriel, which teaches us the pillars of Islam, began with the Prophet ﷺ requesting his companions to ask him questions. Start off with questions. He didn't want to just come and dictate to them. Islam is five pillars. Iman is six pillars. Ihsan is two pillars. He didn't. Instead, he wanted them to ask, you know, he put pressure on them. But on this occasion, they remained silent, waiting. And so Allah sent Angel Gabriel to sit before the Prophet ﷺ and ask the questions of the Prophet ﷺ. What is Islam? So here are the questions. It's coming as an inquiry uh, system of teaching. Yes, there were times when he just gave them factual statements, but many times even these straightforward statements contain provocative attention catching phrases or words which created mental questions in the minds of the listeners. Like the hadith in which Prophet had said, Ad-dunya mal'oona, mal'oonun ma fiha. 
the whole world and its contents are cursed. Oof. That's you know going to put some serious questions in the minds of the listeners, his companions. They heard him say that. What? We are all lost. Then he went on to clarify, as I mentioned earlier. Or on another occasion, the Prophet ﷺ said, support your brother, whether he is the oppressor or the oppressed. Unsur akhaka, daliman aw madluma. This is, of course, how? It's a well-known phrase that they used to say, you know, among in the times of, prior to Islam, amongst the non-Muslims, they would say that. Help your brother, whatever the case may be, whether he's an oppressor or whether he's the oppressor, of course you're gonna question, how? How can we do that, O Messenger of Allah? We can understand when he's oppressed that we help him, but when he's the oppressor? And of course he clarified for them that you stop him. That's how you help him, stop him from oppressing others. You know, or his statement on the occasion, we spoke about this before in earlier sessions, the next person to enter the mosque will be from among the people of paradise. And companions waited, they saw the individual come in. I discussed this hadith earlier, but catching their attention, he could have told them what he wanted to tell them, but instead, he taught it in this way. Or his statement to the man who came in the masjid, did his two rakah, came to sit down beside the Prophet Sallallahu and then he told him, go back and pray because you didn't pray. And he went back and did it and came back and he told him, go back and pray because you didn't pray. Again, you could have just explained to him what you need. But by sending him back three times to the man frustrated, came back and had to say, well, that's the only prayer that I know, Messenger of Allah. So he taught him, and of course, he's teaching everybody there at the same time. But so he sometimes even did provocative actions, like the occasion where he walked up the steps of the member inside the masjid and began to pray a voluntary prayer on top of it. Oh, how's that? Of course, everybody in the masses is wondering, what is the messenger of Allah doing? Because his member was not one like you have now. Some of you might not be surprised because member has, you know, it become so big, you know, some of them covered with canopies and all kinds of things. But yeah, you could go up there, have a meeting with people sitting down so big. No, in his day, it was just three steps. And that last step was the top just a small step, only enough place to stand on. So how in the world was he going to pray there? And so of course they watched him and then he came down when he had to make sujood and went back up again when he was standing in prayer and came down when he had to make sujood and ended the prayer sitting and then told them I only did that in order that you would learn my method of prayer. So, you know, this was, these are teaching moments, teaching opportunities, which the Prophet ﷺ used to bring home that message. So inquiry-based instruction, just as a principle, it promotes active learning that starts by posing questions or problems or scenarios and develops critical thinking skills as opposed to memorizing information from instructional materials. It is a student-centered rather than a teacher-centered method of learning teaching. So those of us who are in the position of teaching, even at home, this can be applied, this is not only for school circumstances, but this is for all circumstances. And this is the prophetic way. The second principle of Ibn Battal was to confirm where unique and inapplicable. 
And we already started off saying that this omniscience is something which is unique to our mind. So these divine names are grounded in knowledge on an infinite plane, which human knowledge cannot begin to fathom, much less imitate. We apply the divine attributes by confirming that they belong to no one besides Allah. And any attempt to give the divine attribute of omniscience, knowledge of the unseen, to his creatures should be rejected and opposed tooth and nail by all. For example, in the case of the official Shiite belief regarding the omniscience of the 12 Imams, Fatima and Prophet Muhammad This should be refuted with the evidence of the Quran and the Sunnah and rejected as a heretical belief involving deifying human beings. Muhammad Rida al-Muzaffar wrote the following under the heading, Doctrine of the Attributes of the Imam and Knowledge of the Imam, in his basic teaching text called The Faith of Shia Islam, printed in the religious center of Qum in Iran. Qum is the Mecca of knowledge in Iran, and for uh, 12 Shiites. He wrote what? We maintain that the powers of the Imams to receive inspiration have reached the highest degree of excellence. And we say that it is a divinely given power well, they say it was being given by God, but still. By this means, the Imam is able to understand information about anything, anywhere, and at any time. SubhanAllah. He goes on to say, and he understands, the Imam, understands by means of this divinely given power at once, without recourse to methodological reasoning, or guidance from a teacher. SubhanAllah. I mean, they're not talking about Imam Khomeini. They're talking about the 12 Imams, the descendants or supposed descendants of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. These expressions are not the individual aberrations of the author. Because you know, sometimes you can find books where people write all kinds of things. Claiming to be Sunni Muslims, whatever. They've written all kinds of stuff. But we consider it to be individual craziness that you know, people can do and are able to do. So is this a, under that heading? So Shiites can say, well, no, 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 no. This guy is just off. It's, it's, it's crazy. No. The book al hujja of the most authentic Shiite collection of tradition known as Al-Kafi. Al-Kafi is like Bukhari for us. Under the heading, the Imams can know anything whenever they wish to. Al Kuleni, the author of Al Kafi, he narrated the following tradition from Jafar, a Sadiq. Whenever an Imam wishes to possess knowledge of anything, he can easily know it. Al Kuleni also related on the authority of Abu Basir from Jafar. Uh, Ibn al-Baqir, that he said, an imam who does not possess knowledge of what will befall him, that's knowledge of the future, and what will be, cannot be
be a hujjah, proof of Allah against his creatures. On the other hand, not to be outdone, Sunni Muslims, particularly the Sufis, they have made similar claims for their saints. And this is one of the reasons why Shiites claim that Sufism is their invention. They're the ones who invented it. So you can find concerning the awliya, the name they give to those who they designate as saints. At Dabbar wrote, I saw a saint, Wali, reach a station wherein he witnessed all intelligent and unintelligent created beings. Wild animals, insects, the heavens and its stars, the earth and the globe of the entire world gained its sustenance, risk from him. Subhanallah. He goes on to say, he heard all of their sounds and conversations in a single instant. And he gave each what they needed and what was best suited for them without being distracted by one from the other. This is Allah. He's describing Saint, Sufi Saint, that he observed himself. Allah had Prophet Abraham, sorry, Allah had Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam disclaim any knowledge of the ghayb, the unseen. In the Quran itself, Allah has puts the words on the lips of the Prophet If it were that I had knowledge of the unseen, I would have accumulated only good and no evil would have befallen me. Did evil befall the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Of course it did. Here's the Prophet in the Quran. This has been now immortalized in the Quran, saying he doesn't have that knowledge. He didn't have that knowledge. Knowledge of the unseen, not at all. Except what was revealed to him, Allah sent him information about things which were coming and sent at, at, on different occasions. You know? But he didn't walk and continually had knowledge of the future for everything and everyone around him, etc. Just instances, miraculous instances where he revealed these things and you know, miracles proving to those around him of his prophet. So we are obliged to oppose such thinking, such claims, to give omniscience, you know, knowledge of everything, everywhere, at any time, to give that to human beings, to the creation, is shirk. It is in its essence shirk. This belongs only to Allah, and we are obliged as true believers, to affirm that it belongs only to him. Moving on to the third principle of Ibn Battal, to have hope where there is promise. The divine names Al-Alim, Al-Alim, and Al-Alam contain promises of revealed and acquired beneficial knowledge down through the ages. Allah taught Adam all of the names to elevate human beings to a status above the angels and the jinn. The combined inherited knowledge of humans separates us from the other creatures around us who are unable to pass on knowledge to the next generation. We teach the dogs tricks, but when the dogs give birth to other dogs, do those dog, are those dogs born with uh, that knowledge? No. And can the uh, dog who we taught the trick, can he teach the other dog 
how to do the trick. No. This is unique to us, which separates us from the rest of humankind. Now, there are some aspects of knowledge which are given to animals, you know, that sometimes outshines the knowledge that we have, the ability to hear, to see, to fly, you know, their abilities which Allah has given them over and above our own personal abilities, individual. But the bottom line is that whenever we teach a monkey, for example, tricks, you can do this, you can do that, and the other, entertain people, everything else, that knowledge dies with him. His descendants cannot acquire that knowledge from him. We have to teach them like we taught him. So seeking knowledge has always been respected in human society. And in Islamic society in particular, from the very beginning, the Prophet ﷺ made a promise in his sunnah of the ultimate reward for those who embark on the quest for knowledge by informing them that Allah had made it a route to paradise. Man salaka tariqa yaltamisu fihi ilman Whoever takes a path seeking knowledge sahalallahu lahu tariqan ila al-jannah Allah will make his or her path to paradise. Consequently, he made seeking knowledge a religious obligation on every Muslim. We all know the hadith, Talabul ilmi faridatun ala kulli Muslim. Seek, seeking knowledge is the religious obligation on every Muslim. However, the Prophet Muhammad did advise that we focus on useful and beneficial knowledge as opposed to the concept of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, like the rover on Mars. Why is it there? Why did they spend billions of dollars to land that rover on Mars, send the first uh, object that flew on a planet outside of the Earth, the helicopter like object which they made. Why? They're searching for life on Mars. Hey, people are dying on the Earth today and now. And you're searching for life on Mars? It's not to say that knowledge of life on Mars, you know, or what they're going to find out is that probably either life did exist there and it no longer exists, or they do find life there, but it is of no consequence. It formed on there, which could have been meteorites from the earth that came and hit there, and there are so many other different ways it could have happened. But in the end, what will it do for us? Because we found a few microbes on Mars, it means that life exists elsewhere in the universe. So it means that we were not, uh, that we were just an accident. That proves that we were just an accident. Uh, accidents don't happen more than once. This spending billions and billions to do this, and people jumping and screaming, we did it, we did it. And, you know, Millions are dying on the earth with the COVID. Those billions spent to improve the healthcare system of the world would have made a huge difference. But knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Well, it's not quite for the sake of knowledge. You know, it is a, to, to prove that we are here by accident. This is really what's at the bottom of it. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, he used to teach us to seek refuge from useless knowledge. And that knowledge from Mars, at this point in time, 
is useless knowledge. Later on, it might be useful knowledge. Not saying that the knowledge, you know, of what's happening on the on Mars, etc. In case we run out of space on Earth and we need to move to Mars, you know, move to another habitable planet, to have knowledge about that planet, you know, how we're going to be able to establish habitat on that planet. It's good, useful then. Now it's useless. Prophet Sallallahu has said in dua it used to make regularly, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge which is of no benefit. He also made conveying knowledge from him a religious obligation. The da'wah that we spoke about before, conveying that knowledge from him, which was from Allah. In the divine name Al-Fattah, talked about the importance of da'wah, tabligh, conveying the message. Proof that this is a community obligation, obligation can be found in the Quran itself, in Surah Ali Imran, verse 104. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةِ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Let there arise among you a group inviting to all that is good, enjoining righteousness and forbidding evil. Those are the successful ones. On the other hand, the individual obligation of da'wah can be seen indicated in the verse from Surah Nahal, verse 125. Call to the way of your Lord. You, each individual, call to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good teaching. So as we mentioned earlier, in case this instruction was perceived as limited to only certain individual groups, like scholars or professionals. The Prophet Muhammad himself broadened the scope of responsibility by making it the individual responsibility of everyone who had any knowledge, saying, Ballihu anni walau aya, convey whatever you've learned from me, even if it's only a single verse. Furthermore, whenever the Prophet Muhammad addressed people, he used to say to them, Let those present convey what they heard those absent, or perhaps he may inform one better able to understand it than him. Conveying that knowledge, passing it on. The best of you are not just those who learn the Quran. Of course, for those who have made that a rite and a ritual, Khatman Quran were children made to go through and complete the Quran, the Quranic text, just reciting it, not knowing a single thing of what is in it, that has become uh, a rite and a ritual, a special party thrown for them, for having completed the Quran, believing that, okay, they have this Quran, it's going to help the rest of the family get into Jannah. This is not the deen. This is Satan tricking people into thinking that these external acts can, in fact, save us. Moving on to the last principle, the fourth principle of Ibn Battal, to have fear where there is a warning. The, the divine names of knowledge in and of themselves do not contain any direct warnings. 
However, Allah himself in the Quran and his messenger in his sunnah openly warned against the great sin of hiding knowledge. Mentioning Allah's curse on those who hide the knowledge. Hide it in the various ways that prevent people from receiving it. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ Indeed, those who hide the clear messages, guidance. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ After I've made it clear to people in the scripture, أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّعِنُونَ those are cursed by Allah and cursed by all who would curse. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, whoever hides knowledge by which Allah benefits people in their affairs of religion, Allah will bridle him on the day of justice, the day of resurrection, the day of judgment, with a bridle from the hell. That's how grave is the sin of hiding knowledge. So this is motivation to spread knowledge rather than keeping it to oneself. Even though we have a tradition amongst some of the ignorant to prevent people from learning this knowledge learning the knowledge of the deen. When the Quran was first translated, people opposed it, tooth and nail. Who, which people? The scholars. Because, you know, their position was that the Quran is in Arabic, so it should not be uh, explained in any other language. It's just Arabic. And it's the reading of the Quran, this is what is important. It's not on them to understand Quran. We will explain it to them. So they wanted to keep this knowledge only amongst a very small, closed circle. But technology made the knowledge available in spite of efforts to prevent it from spreading. So now it's very easy to go on Google, find the meaning of verses, etc., English translations of the Quran. You know, it's at our fingertips. Alhamdulillah, in spite of those who wanted to keep it only for themselves. So others would always have to come to them. They would be the sources. Of course, it's good business. Made money, people have to pay. Have to be paid to get this knowledge. We are going to close our session now by calling on Allah using these names. As it exists in Quran, in the Sunnah, and in our simple du'as. Ya Alim, Ya Alim al-Ghayb, Ya Alam al-Ghayub, Rabbi Zidni Ilma, my Lord, increase my knowledge. This is Surah Taha, verse 114. Prophet also taught us to use his name and dua. Many, I'm just mentioning one. He said, anyone who says in the evening three times, Bismillah al-Nadi, la yadurru ma ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fi sama wa huwa sami'u al-alim. The name of Allah, in the presence of whose name nothing on earth or in the sky can harm. And He is the all hearing, the all knowing. If He says that three times, the Prophet said, nothing will harm them or him or her until the morning. Not saying it in the evening, to protect the individual until the morning. 
And anyone who says it three times in the morning will be protected from harm until the evening. Ola, Ya Alim, Ya Alim, Ya Alam, we know nothing but what you teach us. Instill in us eagerness to learn, guide us to the best knowledge, increase our knowledge and make us benefit from it. Ya Alam, guide us to act upon our ilm, our knowledge, in the ways that please you and staying away from what displeases you, what displeases you. Ya Alim, make us regularly reflect on ourselves and the creation around us and assist us in accepting your decree at all times. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We will now move on to the last portion of our program, our session, our questions and our answers. <clears throat> First question, how do you cope with the law being Al-Alim? With his tests upon human beings. He sometimes gets pleased when his slave has done something good for example, Sahabi who fed the guest of the Prophet I'm not really clear exactly what you're trying to get at. To be clear myself. Um, it's, it's very vague, very, very vague question. I'm sorry about that. Let me move on to Faisal Ali's question. There are some students of knowledge in the West, like Hamza Sources. Oh, this question's a bit chopped up. Um, move on to yet another question uh, from Muna. Sorry if I saw your question was butchered. I couldn't figure it out. Is it permissible to dye our hair of any colors except henna? If yes, in all cases. Well. Dying of hair is permissible. Prophet Muhammad you know, instructed his followers to dye their beards. What was available in that time, it was with henna. That was what was available. Today we live in another time where there are many, many different uh, means to dye uh, beards or hair on the head. Uh, it was also dyed. And um, where it has become fashion for women to dye, speaking their hair and all this, all of this is from the permissible. It's not uh, forbidden, uh, except for the Prophet and them saying to men to dye their beards not to leave it white. Um, um, 
Kundua, Anita, can you please recommend a nice Hispanic school in Addis Ababa for girls and boys, 11 years old and 10 years old? Well, there are a few schools there. As I said, I visited a number of them. The, the most Islamic that I saw was the um, Bicol schools, and um, uh, which are in uh, Betel. This is the uh, the best that I saw in action. I didn't see at all of the schools, so I can't judge. But I was uh, recommended. I went to the. Bicoli, it's Bicoli, Bicoli schools. And um, I gave talks to their grade 11 and 12 students. I looked at the smaller, uh, the lower grades, uh, kindergarten, uh, KT1, KT2, uh, because my daughter, Hind, is. Uh, going to be starting uh, preschool in the fall, in September. So I was looking at different options for her. So this uh, holy school I uh, found to be uh, one of the best. My wife <clears throat> uh, from Kenya who herself is the headmaster of uh, preschool and primary school in Somaliland. Uh, she assessed and uh, felt that this was one of the best. We visited others, Hilltop, uh, and uh, a couple of others, but uh, this seemed to be the best uh, in terms of their organization, their Islamic content, uh, you know, stressing Islam while teaching the other uh, areas of learning. Zahid Shah asks, what verses should I read from the Quran daily in order to remain positive all the time? <laughs> um, as she goes on to explain, no one in my family is earning money. My father retired from service as a personnel officer, but no pension. So it's in a difficult circumstance. Well, of course, um, to remain positive under those circumstances, this is Ibadah. This is Ibadah. And this is the test, as Allah said, so I will test you with fear, health, and loss of wealth. Um, there are many positive verses in the Quran, and um, uh, inshallah. If you read, what you can do is when you read, you can take aside those verses. And I, actually, many of the verses may not even be clearly positive, but once you reflect on them, you can see the positivity. They're not negative, but they're, they're explaining things with which you might say, well, there's no positive or negative in it. But with deeper thought, you might find in it you know, positive guidance. Uh, so perhaps you do a search on Google 
positive verses of the Quran. Uh, perhaps we will find somebody has already compiled such a um, text or lecture or whatever. Super packs as the Prophet said, make dua entire camel. Exhaust your efforts towards what one seeks. Will Allah ar -Ra'uf, help completely when one is practically unable to exhaust any effort due to illness? Well, can we say Allah will help completely in terms of what you consider to be complete? Maybe not. But Allah's help is completely there. How it is manifest may depend or vary from person to person, circumstance to circumstance. So the better approach is to make dua for Allah's help and be patient with whatever he gives. And uh, may Allah cure your illness and heal you completely. I mean, make whatever suffering you are going through purification from sin. Malik asks or mentions about Allah being above his throne. Does it mean Allah was below? But Allah is most high. Um, Allah rose above his throne. It's more literal translation. Now this is, this is something we discussed earlier about uh, understanding Allah. If we try to understand Allah, on the basis of our understanding of this world. And that's all that we are able to do. Because we can't understand what is not from this world when our knowledge is limited to this world. So what happens though is that when we try to apply this knowledge, knowledge of this world, to Allah, we run into problems because we make him then like us. So when Allah describes himself as being above this throne, or he rose above this throne, we're thinking that if you rose above, you had to have been below and then you went above. Well, that's how it works in our world, in our limited world. But in that limitless, limitless world, that existence which Allah created, remember, all of his creation is below him. Then the rising or the descending, etc., which is mentioned in different verses or uh, hadiths, etc. We have to not try to interpret it according to this world's four dimensions, up, down, right, left. We have to stay away from that because then it just brings a whole set of confusion trying to understand the un-understandable. <clears throat> um, we don't have any questions right now from our Instagram uh, students. Hopefully, we'll have some shortly. Our 
students of the YouTube, Sauda Abdul Haq, always Salatul Tasbih performed. What are the benefits of performing it? Well, you know, Salatul Tasbih, there are a number of different narrations. And in each narration, there's a different way. Because of that, many scholars felt that it's not authentic. And even if it is, it does have a thread of authenticity, then which of the ways should you choose? So uh, I don't recommend the, the practice of Salat al Nadira Tajuddin, I've done some transcriptions of your lectures in IOU. Inshallah, if it benefits, do you want me to do the transcription for these lecture series? It's also during my semester break, inshallah. Well, um, it's not necessary because uh, the lectures have been fully uh, written up. And they, uh, as I mentioned, at the end of our series will be uh, finally, finally edited and published as a text. So if it were just simply audio, then definitely I would welcome your offer to transcribe. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, perhaps some of my other lectures on YouTube, uh, you may want to check some of those other lectures and um, uh, do a transcription like my lectures on the Magnificent Seven. Seven were shaded by Allah's throne on the day when there would be no shade but the shade of his throne. That is one that a uh, number of people have asked me about, which uh, I didn't have written up, or I had it written up and it lasted forever. Um, the, the transcription of it may be beneficial. So, if you'd like to tackle that one, then mashallah, you're welcome during your semester break. Lil uh, Hari, I want to ask you, is playing video games that have killing haram, haram? Well, it's a game, you know, so it's, no, you're a kid, if you're a kid, uh, then uh, dealing with this, uh, it's not haram, of course, it's not preferable. Games which, you know, are educational. This is again, ilmin la yanfa, to avoid. People become experts at these games. But it's really of no benefit. It doesn't help them in this life or the next. I mean, there are some people who become number one, they make big money and some things, okay. So it's for them a you know a profession. But for the average person, it's just hours, hours, hours waste. Which can never be brought back again. They're lost. God. It's not to say we can't enjoy ourselves too. And the Prophet did engage in recreation, you know, camel racing, horse racing, running with his wives, and all this. Yeah, it's, mashallah, it's good. But you know, we try to choose the entertainment which has some benefit coming out of it more than just the enjoyment of the moment. Uh, any questions from the Instagram? Instagram? Students, no? 
inshallah <clears throat> Uh, it's uh, hers, what's this? He's a son of Mary. Messages. All powerful also means to break strength of love in the heart of man. When they love their man, their man made idols. It's unclear already. Ahnaf Shan Rayan. Can I make the Nia of Salah in my own language? The Nia, of course. There is no special format or words in Arabic, which the Prophet ﷺ taught for the niya. Niya is your intention. And you have to think that intention. You have to have that intention. If you want to say it, and of course, this is not from the sunnah. It's not recorded in the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ said his intention or the Sahaba made verbal audible intentions for prayer. This is not from the Sunnah. In fact, many scholars consider this to be bid'ah, or an innovation. And it's something which came from teaching children, you know, because children will tend to run into prayer without thinking or even being aware which prayer they're making. So they taught them to say, in me, no way to. And usalliya, arba rakaatin, dhuhran, muqtadiyan bil imam, muqtajihan ilal qibla, something like this. I intend to make four units of prayer behind imam, facing the qibla, etc., etc. You don't have to do that. I mean, if you walk into the masjid, you're awake. You're walking in there for what? For the Lord? Yeah, okay. So you have to say, I'm intending to pray the Lord. And you're walking in already for the Lord. Um, you're going to pray behind the Imam. That's why you came to a masjid. You're not praying at home. You're not the Imam. You have to say, I intend to pray behind now. The masjid is set up in such a way that, you know, Qibla is identified and people line up facing the Qibla. So we have to say, I intend to pray behind the Imam, Duhur, facing the Qibla. No, you see, this is something which has become widespread, uh, mainly for people of the Shafi school. Not that Imam Shafi taught this. They call it Shafi practice. But Imam Shafi himself didn't teach this. This is not in his uh, uh, teachings in this book, and Um. You know. It's not there. People added it many centuries later. So if you feel you have to say something, then say it in your language, in Bangla, or Bengali. Question, uh, Instagram question. What name is most commonly thought to be a name of Allah, but is in fact not one of them? Rashid, Abdul Rashid. I have a number of friends named Abdul Rashid. But it's not. 
Fiz asks, is it permissible to pray for non-Muslim relatives and friends to be guided? Yes, it's not permissible. It is recommended. It's wajib on you to help them find their way. And one of the ways to help them find their way is to pray to Allah to guide them. Somebody who calls himself the king of Detroit. Do you think hell is eternal? This is for both sinners, Muslims, and non-believers. As far as I've seen from my own studies, hell is eternal. Verses of the Quran, statements of the Prophet وسلم, all indicate that. There are some hadiths which indicate otherwise, but they are not authentic. Nfamara, Nfamara, Sise, when are we permitted? To look at women when you marry them and before marrying them to look at them as the Prophet told us to see them etc and otherwise you know in functioning in society walking in the streets uh, People are going to come across your vision. And if you have seen them, you've looked at them, this is not in and of itself a sin. It is the staring, you know, following them. That's, that's a whole nother story. Okay. <laughs> that's more than just looking at them. You've seen them. You know, but, you know, eyeballing, um, staring, this is what we are guided to avoid. Uh, Abu Amjad asked, do we have to pray missed salah when we were young? Um, if this is something really not feasible, you know, you became you reach puberty at the age of 12, 13. So you woke up to Islam at the age of 19, six years later, or in your 20s. Now to go and pray for every year. How many prayers are there in a year? That's going to be on your head. You ask a lot to forgive what passed and you deal with the present. You woke up, you became a proper Muslim. Before that, you are a Muslim in name, unconscious, whatever, don't count it. Uh, he said, my IOU degrees have been criticized by some who point out that students who learn online lack suhba with their teachers, that this deviates the education received, or the value, sorry, the education received. What is your take on that? <laughs> well, you know, and people can say anything. And of course, having a teacher in front of you, 
who you sit with and learn with. It's superior to going to a classroom and the teacher delivers. You can't sit with him. You got the message, you go down the teaching, etc. And then you have online study where the teacher appears on a screen. You can discuss with him. He provides the knowledge. There are others you can discuss with, but the basic knowledge is there, the books are available, etc. You study and you gain the knowledge, etc. Um to put down or denigrate knowledge which is not given in the most traditional way is ignorance. You know, actually, Sheikh Masur Din al-Bani, one of the greatest muhaddis of our time, was criticized in a similar way. He lived in the library in Syria, studying the books of hadith and so on, so on, detail. He had teachers earlier on, but you know, when he began his major research, he just lived in the library. He said, well, his, his teacher was books. So we can't depend on his knowledge. But the work that he has done is recognized by scholars all around the world. So in the end, it is what you have gained and how you apply what you have gained. Because, as I said, those people who used to study by, as I say, sitting under a tree. The muallim, the teacher, would be there. And he would sit around him and he would teach right there. He lived with him. He, he had a compound, lived with him ate with him, spoke with him, you were advised by him. This is superior to going to a school, sitting in a classroom. A teacher comes, he teaches you, and he goes. You can ask him questions too, but mostly he comes, he teaches, answers some questions, and goes. He's not responsible for your terbiya. The upbringing. He's not there molding and guiding and so on. So they put down classroom teachers. Boko Haram. <laughs> People who take this kind of position, this, that's, that's who they end up with. Boko Haram. The Western style of education in classrooms and you know, this is Haram. Western style education. This, this is extreme. These are extreme thoughts. The bottom line is, you know, brother, you've done your bachelor's of arts and Islamic studies from IOU, you studied your material well, and you did well on your test, and you taught the people of your area. You know, you had assignments to do. You had to teach. Pass on that knowledge. All those four years that you studied, then you went and did a master's, you know, the MAIS, Master's of Arts in Islamic Studies. And you further taught and further studied and so on. You know what you have gained. So what is your worry? People will always have something to say. Your worry is how best can I convey this knowledge to others? That's what your worry is. 
Don't worry about people talking. They will always talk till you go in the grave. Even after that, some people will talk at your grave and talk after they've left the cemetery. Is this new? Didn't people talk about the Prophet and said he was a fake? He was a, you know, magician or a uh, whatever, fake healer, um, warlock, whatever. They call him all kinds of names. But did that stop him? Did it mean that simply because they detracted from him, he, they tried to put him down and all this, did it mean that he was what they thought, or what they said? No. He just had tunnel vision. He got the job done. So that's where you need to focus, you know, perhaps, you know, depending on the circumstances that you find yourself in, you, know, you can uh, respond to them with appropriate examples, inshallah. Daniel Nemeth, is a law in the heavens or above the heavens? Here we go again. Allah is above the heavens. Faisal Ali, what is the best book? on linguistic miracles of the Quran in English. I don't know what the best book is. But I don't know of a single book dedicated to the linguistic miracles of the Quran. Muna, today is the 27th night of Ramadan here. What virtuous acts special duas and I do after Tarawi prayers to ask Allah's forgiveness for my previous sins. Thank you for that. The well known dua of Anta Afuan to Hibbul Afwa Fafuana. Oh Allah, you are the forgiving, you love forgiveness. So forgive us. Aisha had asked the Prophet uh, for a dua for the prayers to have to other seeking the other. And this is what he gave. And virtuous acts, of course. The Prophet didn't really stress, you know, virtuous acts in the night of Laylatul Qadr. We're seeking Laylatul Qadr. Um, but if one were to uh, read Quran before or after Tarawih, um, if one had the opportunity to carry food to the poor, the needy, etc. Then all these are virtuous acts, whether we do it in the day or we do it in the night, inshallah. Uh, Kasumba is asking, when is the exact time to end this poor? When the Adhan of Fajr begins, then we should end it. What does it mean about the white thread, the black thread? There's the white thread of the dawn, you know, um, which comes on the horizon. If you're living in a city where the buildings all around you, you can't see the horizon, then you need not worry about it. But if you live in a countryside area or you are on a higher building than everybody else, where you can see the horizon, 
then the coming of Fajr comes as a, a light thread across the horizon, uh, separating it from the darkness of the night before it lightens up the whole. Nazir al-Din, I'm seeking a pathway from my master's engineering management degree to PhD in Islamic studies. Well, I think it's best you discuss with Professor Ahsan from the UK, who is the deputy vice chancellor of academics. Um, he can advise you. Uh, perhaps taking the uh, bridge to master's program, which helps those who wanted to go into master's, uh, who didn't have Islamic studies backgrounds, that this uh, helped them bridge into the master's program. Perhaps it, it's relevant as a, a bridge to PhD also. Um, Sauda Abdul Haq on the issue of Yatikaf, is it performed in the masjid for women? Yeah, in the time of the Prophet his wives performed the Yatikaf and other women from the community performed the Yatikaf in the masjid. Rehearse Isa, son of Maryam. Is there mention that God, the God of Abraham, will not give punishment from heaven after punishment to the people of Samud? Um, not that I know of. I'm not familiar with that. With that, inshallah, we've come to an end the questions. I'm sorry for those who sent questions, but uh, somehow they were not intelligible. I have to do try to be precise in what you're saying. Try to say it in as few words as possible. You know, um, because once things become long, they become jumbled, and ideas become confusing. So better. Uh, Keep it as short as possible, you know, <clears throat> one sentence, simple, clear, and inshallah, we'll try our best to answer those questions which we can. And for those questions which we can't, please excuse me, uh, as my knowledge is not all encompassing, it's limited to what I have studied and learned over the years. So with that, we'll close down our session now. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yamanullah.